Dr. Death here. His video has gone absolutely viral in two weeks. Almost, uh, I think it's over 60,000 views now. Massive hit with everybody. He's graced us with his time again. He's been doing some work in Guildford. And he stopped by my house. I'm having problems with my Zoom and live streaming and everything else. So I've been able to live stream with people properly. But because he's here, we just sat in the studio together. Huge thank you for coming on. And with this case in the news, oh, it's absolutely crazy. We're going to be getting into that, incels, the language, and some of the other projects that Dr. Das is working on now. Do you want to just give a brief reintroduction of yourself for people who are not familiar? Sure, absolutely. Firstly, Sean, thank you for having me on again. It's an absolute pleasure to be on your channel. So, yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Shaham Das, and I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. So, for my day job, I assess and rehabilitate mentally disordered offenders either in prisons or in courts or in secure psychiatric units. And I'm also uh, the host of a YouTube channel called The Psych for Sore Minds, where I kind of analyze some of my more interesting cases anonymously. And I also talk about high profile true crime cases. And I'm gonna share the link for this live stream in a second, but Dr. Das is just gonna go over the basics of what happened in Plymouth first, before we look at the mindset of the shooter and the incel community. So for people who are not familiar with the violence that's just recently occurred, are you okay to give a little bit brief description of that? Uh, yeah, I, I think I know the very basics. Okay. So this man, Jake Davison, who obviously identified with the whole incel movement, and I think that drove uh, his actions. Was it a week ago, Sean? Yeah, last week. Yeah. Last week, he uh, went postal, for want of a better word, and he <laughs> went on uh, quite a tragic killing spree, really. So he killed five people. His first victim was his mother, who he'd, been ha who he'd had a problem with, been having arguments with, I believe because he believed that she owed him some money. And then he went on a, a random killing spree. He killed five people altogether, uh, horrifically and tragically, including a three-year-old girl. And I'm going to play now a clip so you can actually hear the killer's own words. Just bear with me two seconds. Come on, I'll come. I'm so beaten down and defeated for life. That drive that I once had, that's gone, man. You know, I'll try, and I'll, I'll, I'll always keep trying. But it's, it's like, I'm at the point now where it's like, why do I even bother? Like, for what? You know? I'm still in the same house, same situation, same position, situation, same. Everything's still the same. For the most part, it's just been me against the world. It's, it's just been me fighting an uphill battle with a big rock on my back, you know, while, while I'm seeing that don't deserve half of anything. Now, they're getting a free road to the top. The whole premise of the Terminator movies is that, you know, everything's rigged against you. There's no hope for humanity. You know, we're on the, the brink of extinction, you know. These machines are unstoppable killing machines that, that can't be beaten, can't be outsmarted. But yeah, humanity still tries to fight to the end. And, I know it's a movie, but you know, I like to think sometimes, you know, on Terminator or something, despite, despite, um, you know, reaching almost total system failure, he keeps trying to accomplish his mission, you know? All right, so you heard him talk about the Terminator there, and many people who have come across this case on the news have never even heard of the incel community so an incel is an involuntary celibate. That is somebody who has not had sex, a virgin, male, with a misogynistic belief system that has been cultivated online to the point now where they estimate there are hundreds of thousands of incels worldwide and there are tens of thousands of them in the UK. They have their own language. Dr. Das, I was speaking to him earlier about doing a real deep dive on this because we've only got an hour or so tonight. 
whereby we're going to, you know, really look at the history of the spree shooters. We're going to look at all of the language in more depth. But tonight we'll just look at some of the basics. Let us know in the chat if you would like to see Dr. Das come back to the studio and do a full deep dive on this. Uh, because it is an absolutely fascinating subject. This is like what they were trying to um, call for to be labelled as a terrorist organisation this morning on the news here in this country because of the threat it presents and it's a combination of gaming culture, uh, videos and um, the basic language is then a normie or a Becky is a woman who is not going around in a more sexually attractive way as labelled by the incels. So the siren type woman they label as a Stacy. And the male equivalent is called a Chad. And the incels fall back on skull and bone measurements and chin measurements as part of what they believe is a genetic deficiency that is preventing them from women finding them attractive. It's really sad because there's a lot of depressed, lonely people and they're getting manipulated into this movement which has an extremist edge. And we saw the three spree murders now. I did a video approximately two years ago on the first two spree murders because people were asking me what will happen to these these people if they ever end up in prison and um, it's not going to end well for them because you know people who commit crimes against women and kids it's, it's kill on sight or at least you're going to get a beat down so I did document Rogers uh, Rogers um, spree and Alec Manassian the Canadians spree so Roger he stabbed and shot girls mostly females sorority girls and Alec, he drove a vehicle into people, killing mostly women, both of them. Absolutely horrendous what happened. The first is deceased, but the Alec ended up in prison in Canada where he's doing a life sentence. So now we've got the, you know, they've been inspired by Elliot, Roger and Alec. The, the, the Plymouth shooter has been inspired by them. And we're going to get into a little bit more of that. But I'm going to continue to share the link over here on this other computer. I'll be back in a few seconds. But I'll let Dr. Das take over from what I just said. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to talk a little bit about what I got from that clip of seeing Jake Davison. Because I think it's really interesting. I think actually we saw a, um, a really clear window into his psyche in just that short period of time. So the first thing that strikes me as a psychiatrist is the negative conditions which indicate depression. So he's saying things like, why do I bother? Uh, you know, I put in all this effort, I have the same house and the same position, it's me against the world. He's obviously preoccupied with being ugly. Also, at some point, he talks about a lack of drive and motivation. So to me, this is barn door, clearly depression. So depression is more than just low mood, it's also a lack of energy and all these negative conditions. The other thing that kind of excited me a little bit as a psychiatrist was the fact that he was talking about the Terminator. Now, I don't think this is psychosis because he said clearly that he feels like the Terminator and he also said, I know it's just a movie. But in another set of circumstances, it's very possible and some of the patients that I assess who committed horrific violence have psychotic beliefs. So they might, for example, think that they are the Terminator. But I think in this particular case, it's a red herring. So I think all of these things in combination can at least explain some of uh, Davison's actions. Yeah, and Elliot Roger actually wrote a manifesto for the incels over 100 pages long calling for this incel rebellion whereby they take out their frustration on innocent women because they believe that all women must pay. And the sad thing is, didn't we have, wasn't a victim a three-year-old girl in the recent yeah. one? Yes. Absolutely horrendous, you know. Mm. A three-year-old girl, it, it, it's bad enough to kill a woman. But to wipe out a, a kid like that, it's absolutely disgusting. So, 
you know, perhaps if incels are watching this video, we call on you guys. This is not a manly thing to do, to wipe people out through your frustration. We call on you guys to channel this energy into something else because we've all been frustrated teenage horny lads that couldn't get laid. We've all been incels. You are not alone. Over time, nature, something's going to happen. There's someone out there for everybody. Absolutely. You don't have to have a Sylvester Stallone jawline to be found attractive to the opposite sex. This is just... Um, what, what's, what kind of brainwashing and manipulation is that? So I, think, I don't think it's a new phenomenon. I think there's always been a small proportion of, of sexually frustrated males that have had misogynistic views. What I think is different, what I think has changed, and that what I think is driving the incel movement is they now have a platform, they now have a forum. Because you can't just go out and share these beliefs with, with anybody because you're likely to get your head kicked in. Hmm. But if you, go to, if you find areas on the dark corners of the internet, then you can have other people that support your beliefs. And if they give you permission to act in a certain way, speak in a certain way, use derogatory term, terms towards women, then it, it builds this support and this movement. So yeah, it's, it's a very potentially extremely dangerous situation, I think. So they're like trying to recruit people through like um, gaming platforms, y you know, young lads like 10, 11, 12 years old. I mean, what could be done to stop this movement from expanding to the point where, you know, the frequency of these spree killings increases? You mean decreases. Decreases, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, I think, I think there's uh, a couple of approaches. So you can think about the individualistic approach. So I think parents have a responsibility to, to look at the content uh, that their children are, are, are watching. And I think it's very easy for children to get groomed when they feel that they're belonging to part of the community, whether that's originally through gaming and now it's for older men who are trying to brainwash them. So I think that's one issue. And the other issue is for um, the police or other companies to, to, to uh, supervise and observe what the content that's being put out there. And I think it's only fair that big platforms like Facebook, for example, have a responsibility in curtailing hateful misogynistic views. All right, so you've got a super chat question. Do you think he killed more because there was no way back? I think he, the short answer is yes, I think he, he had such a level of frustration and hatred that he just didn't care anymore. I think he was willing to end his life, I think he hated his mother and he just wanted to get rid of her and I think once he made that decision there was no turning back, he didn't, it didn't really make a difference to him who he killed. I think that's reflected by the very randomness that he would pick on an innocent child because somebody in their right mind wouldn't make that decision so yes, I think that's, that's correct. How do the spree killers compare, the incel spree killers compare to other killers you have psychoanalyzed? So I should say the vast majority of the people that I analyzed haven't committed murder and even the ones that do, only a very small proportion go on to kill other people. Because I'm a psychiatrist, I tend to treat people who've got mental illness. So the vast majority of them have something like schizophrenia or some form of psychosis. So they're not in control of their thoughts and their actions. They suffer from hearing voices or paranoid delusions. So that's, that's a big difference. So what formed these guys then? Like, have you looked at whether they suffered any abuse or had any previous criminal history? Of the patients that I see? No, the, the three in cell killers, yeah. yeah. So I, I know, knowing, I, I don't know very much about um, Elliot Rogers' background, I'm afraid, but I do know about Alec Manassian and, to a degree, Jake Davison's. So I, th I think that something that can't be overlooked is the fact that Alec Manassian clearly had autism and Jake Davison was at least suspected of having autism. Now, just to be very clear, I'm in no way suggesting that autism directly leads to violence and the vast majority of people that have autism, of course, are not dangerous. However, if you're, all, you're already kind of isolated, marginalised and you feel inferior and you feel different, then that feeds into the, uh, the kind of incel way of thinking specifically about not being able to, to uh, get attractive women. And then if you have autism on top of that, when you struggle to understand social norms and you struggle to get social reciprocity, then I think it can make some people, very small proportion, but some people feel even more marginalised, even more isolated. So I think it all, they're all risk factors that come together in this perfect storm, especially for those two 
Jake Davison on the collective list. What about the role of medication then? So if they were diagnosed with things, were they on and off meds? And you hear about people are particularly vulnerable to violent crime when they're coming off meds. Did meds play any role in, in these killings? Um, not in these killings because there's no direct medication for autism. So there's no tablet that can reverse autism. You can have medication to take the edge off some of the comorbid disorders like depression and anxiety. But the medication that you're talking about is far more relevant in people with the other people that I see in my clinical work. So people with psychosis, for example, when they come off antipsychotic medication, it's a combination of a couple of things. It can be withdrawal. So when you've been on a high dose of this medication and you suddenly stop it, your body's not used to it. But probably more significantly, if you're psychotic, you're taking antipsychotics and they help with that psychosis, then it logically follows. If you stop taking your medication, then the psychotic symptoms return. And sometimes mm. they re return really intensely. So mm. those voices, that paranoia, so absolutely that drives the offending in the patients that I see. Question coming from SFC South Coast. Why is internet history not taken into account when holding a gun license, even though it may be an invasion of privacy? So, you know, I was in Arizona, guns are common. People in the UK are quite alarmed when they hear you know, about the, how many guns are available in America. How did this guy even get a gun? So my understanding is that when people get a gun license in the UK, the people in charge look at three particular areas and they are whether this person's a danger to the public, whether this person has a mental illness and the social media posts and beliefs of this person. So I think Jake Davison ticks all three boxes. So I, I'm at a loss to explain how this could have slipped through there. So I really don't know the answer to that. I think if they were doing their job correctly, then on all three counts, he shouldn't have been given access to a weapon. One comment is, do we read the comments? Yes, we are reading the comments. And here's another question from John Doe, who is going to look after the mental health of mental health care staff? Now, mental health support is at a collapse. So that's just a general question, I believe. Sure, so that's quite a better question. <laughs> um, I think that, well, people that work in secure services like myself, who work with violent offenders, are offered supervision and they are offered sort of therapy or forums to talk about uh, the kind of <clears throat> the transference that they get from, from aggression and from violent patients. I think your average mental health worker, so somebody who doesn't work in a secure setting like myself, I don't think they have very much, to be honest with you. They're not routinely offered much support in their mental health. It's up to them to do what everybody else would do, to go see their GP, to get on a waiting list. But absolutely, it's a problem. Resources, always a problem. Do you believe, Dr. Das, that the Columbine killers were incels? Um, I, as far as I'm aware, they had a a general feeling of hatred and resentment towards other children because they themselves felt isolated and marginalised. But as far as I'm aware, they didn't feel uh, sexually deprived. So I don't think that's quite the same as incel. I think some of the thought processes and the hatred clearly was there, but I don't think they specifically identified with the incel movement. Don't tell me, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> I've done research into these things. I think they predated the incel movement, didn't they? So the, in, the term incel was invented by a, was it a bisexual woman in the 1990s? What was her name, Alana or something? But then it was co-opted by uh, you know, what we're seeing now. So we've got a question here from Socrates. Elliot Roger was assessed and had pervasive development disorder, which I've never heard of, could Dr. Das please expand upon that, Sean? So pervasive development disorder is like a blanket term for all kinds of, um, of developmental illnesses. So autism absolutely falls in that category. Uh, so does Asperger's and so do some rarer kind of syndromes that you probably wouldn't have heard of because they're, they're not as common and they're not as publicised. But absolutely, it's, it's that same kind of illness as autism is. Yeah. So what's the symptoms of that? So generally speaking, people with autism, they have, as I mentioned before, problems with social reciprocity. So they can't read other people's moods or their intentions. And on top of that, they, they struggle to communicate. So they don't have the body language, eye contact. And as well as that, they tend to have quite restricted and narrow ranges of interests. So in this particular case, we know that Jake Davison was obsessed with guns as a kid. So it's possible, and I can't really say definitively unless I got the opportunity to assess him, but it's very possible that he wasn't just interested in guns like some young men are, but that he was obsessed with it and that could have been related 
it is what it is. I remember when I was growing up, I was obsessed with video games. Uh, some of those video games, you know, you're killing each other or you're killing entities. And they were saying back then, you know, there's no relationship between video games and violence. And now we've seen more recently, you know, we had a guest on who talked about the scoreboard in London where the gangs, it's like a fusion of gang culture and gaming culture whereby you, you go into a different postcode, you stab someone up or kill them and you get points on your scoreboard. Do you think then that this old school video games and violence, there's no correlation, do you think that's out the window now? So I think it is very complicated. I think that for the vast majority of people, you're interested in violent video games, as was I. Street Fighter 2 was my poison back in the day. Mortal Kombat. <laughs> the vast majority of people don't get influenced by, by um, violent video games, violent films, you know, uh, violent music, because we have uh, parental boundaries. We are socialised with domesticated. Having, uh, but the difference would be if you come from a background where, for example, you have very inconsistent parenting, or you grow up in a gang where you have your your moral boundaries are very loose and you're kind of encouraged to commit violence. I think in those specific situations, people are more vulnerable to being influenced by violence, I think. And what about people who have certain diagnoses of mental disorders? Uh, absolutely, it's possible. So I think, again, speaking about psychotic disorders, so that's taking uh, living outside of reality. So people who have delusional beliefs that are not true, it's very possible that their the violent video games can can play into some of their delusions and i'm sure in the, it's a long time ago but i'm sure i've seen at least one patient who was kind of um, who had delusional beliefs about a video game yeah. i mean if you're like just a reclusive living person and you're just obsessed with video games slaughtering people all day long online was that wasn't there like um an attack was it on a mosque or something where the guy went in it was almost video game style he, he filmed himself killing all those people was it in France or somewhere like that I, can't, I, can't, I remember watching it I was thinking oh my god this is real but he's like he's reenacting like like he's, he's acting like he's in a video game while he's killing all these people I think the video was taken down but it was this mass uh, murder in a, I think it was in a, a mosque yeah. and um, it was a famous case so it makes you wonder you know the desensitization if you're just killing people online all day long and then you've never actually seen a real life killing but you go out with a high powered weapon and kill people your brain must go in shock if you're killing someone but perhaps if you've already been doing it online for years and years and years it's become normalized to you well i think it's it's probably a combination of many things so as i said before it's people who have not had proper parenting and who have not grown up in there with normal moral boundaries and restrictions are probably more vulnerable to that and also if they're suffering from either overt florid psychosis or borderline psychosis they might not distinguish reality from fantasy so i don't think the average person would be affected like that if somebody who's vulnerable absolutely they, they could not fully understand what's real and what's not okay so dizzy is asked do antidepressants play a part in mass killings i remember there was a case of a pilot who crashed his plane into a mountain mm. and he was coming down off antidepressants and he took everybody with him. So what's what's the role of antidepressants and being on and off? I mean, I we touched on that earlier. Yeah. I suppose the difficulty is knowing what, how much of that was his depression and how much of that was coming off the antidepressants. So it could be one of two things. It could be that somebody's coming off the dose too quickly, which causes withdrawal symptoms, similar to what I was saying before about antipsychotics. Although the level of agitation is usually fairly tolerable, fairly but variable. It's not as bad as, for example, coming off uh, alcohol if you're addicted or you know coming off crack. So that wouldn't generally explain somebody going to such extreme uh, kind of measures. So arguably it's probably more the depression that because he's coming off the medication, the depressive thoughts were coming back. And it seemed that he was quite nihilistic in his view. So he didn't live, but he also didn't care or have any kind of empathy or sympathy for the lives of all those people on that plane. Wow. Paul, a man, wants to know, why would a psychiatrist direct a dangerous psychopath to a misogynistic hate site like MGTOW? Uh, I don't think they would. I, I don't think that would be an acceptable action from a psychiatrist. What is MGTOW? I don't know. I'll let you... Um, the next question, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that in a second. Alfie Devine wants to know, are there any females in, in some movements? 
from my understanding, you can have females in incel movements as possible. I mean, if they basically believe the same core values, that they're uh, unattractive and that they uh, are sexually repressed and they, uh, and they have, uh, they're aiming for more attractive partners but are failing. So technically it's possible, although I think the vast majority of people would be male. So men going their own way is a movement um, whereby they live their lives with no female contact. This idea began on the fringes of the internet. And MGTLW, yeah, that's what it means. Men going their own way. Right. The views are unorthodox, even with the sprawling web of groups, lifestyles and cults known as the Manosphere, where women haters mobilize against a supposed gynocratic conspiracy while incels plot violent revenge on women and pickup artists develop predatory tactics to gain women into having sex with them, the men of MGTOW attempt to eschew relationships with women altogether. They are literally going their own way, far away from women, no women at all. What are your thoughts on that? So it seems like a far less dangerous belief system compared to incels. Because I suppose the difference is that incels feel entitled. They, des they believe that they deserve sex and they feel jealous of females and of better looking men that get it. Whereas the people that you're describing, uh, they don't have that issue, it seems. Okay, so, just go through the questions. I heard that one already. Um, who was the third person in the room? When Miss Humphrey said no comment, I'm not sure what that refers to. That's from Disco Stew. No idea. Antidepressants are a massive money maker. They will always push them as opposed to proper diagnosis and treatment. Do you think that an incel that did not commit suicide could be rehabilitated? <clears throat> I think my view is skewed because of what I do for a living. So my uh, my business is rehabilitating mental disorder offenders. So my answer would be yes. I think it's possible. That's not to say that it, it can happen in every case. I think if it, not just an incel, but anybody that has committed horrific violence, if they have insight and motivation to change, it's possible. So some people. Uh, are just born in horrific environments and they come from places of abuse and they witness uh, violence or in the, in the case of an incel they might be brainwashed from quite a young age and they might have a very warped way of thinking and then after they've committed atrocities whether in prison whether in psychiatric hospital some people not all uh, will reflect on that and they will realize the error of their ways they will engage in rehabilitation whether that's you know about domestic violence anger management um, and there's sometimes there's other factors. So other factors would be things like uh, drug and alcohol use, uh, mental illness. So I'm not saying that incel is uh, being an incel is a mental illness. That's just a way of thinking. But it might be, for example, depression, anxiety on top of that. So if all of these things get treated, and if somebody engages to and wants to change, then absolutely, I think it's possible. I think it's possible for anybody to potentially be rehabilitated. Well, lad has asked, do you think incels should sexually transmute? the energy into lifting weights. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that's, that's, the, the question is put in a humorous way, but I think mm. there's probably something in that. I mean, I think it's fair to say that incels probably have all this pent up frustration and sexually charged energy. And I think for some people, if they did put that into exercise, then, then yeah, it'd certainly be a healthier outlet than, than using misog misogyny and violence. I think that physical activity boosts your mental state. I was heavily into drug use and adrenaline and all that stuff and I had to find something else to put in its place. And you know, just before Dr. Das came here I was out swimming, did, did some weights. And if you can keep the physical active, the mental will be on form. If you're a Reddit kid and you're in your parents' basement for a year and you've not seen any sunlight and you're getting rickets, your mental state is going to be off the hook. So you're more likely to commit weird, uh, exhibit weird behavior. I'm not saying that you're going to go out on, on a spree, but it's very important that we are hunter gatherers. Two thirds of the human body is designed for movement. 
So if you just sat hunched over a computer all day, not doing the physical stuff that you're supposed to be doing, the physical starts to malfunction, the mental starts to malfunction. So I think being physically fit can help save people's sanity if they're borderline, you know, starting to do the minds. And I think different people have different outlets, right? So I, I absolutely agree that I think physical exercise can help for a lot of people, but there will be uh, a small proportion who won't gain any benefit because it's just not for them. But people, you know, find other hobbies. Some people find God. Um, some people get clean off drugs and alcohol. Some people do wild and wonderful hobbies like stand-up comedy, for example. So I think it depends on the individual, but I think there's always a healthier outlet to violence and misogyny. I'm just smiling at that comment. From Peanut Patterson, incels should try body combat. <laughs> Scooter in the house. If you're not familiar with body combat, it is like a rave without the drugs. If you come out on natural high, you're basically jumping, kicking, burning almost a thousand calories to high energy dance music like Scooter. <laughs> All right, yeah, incels should definitely try body combat. The ratio of women to men in there is actually favorable. <laughs> um, at these uh, high energy dance music aerobics classes, I think some men are intimidated uh, to go in, especially get on the front row. You got to work your way up. I ended up becoming the um, the best man at the wedding of my body combat instructor. <laughs> I worked my way up from the back to the front. <laughs> All right, so Sid UK, why did the government allow this guy to own a shotgun while living in a residential area? I. I have absolutely no idea. So, as I said in one of my previous questions, my understanding is that when they uh, <clears throat> when they permit gun licences, they look at three things: they look at whether somebody's a danger to the public, has got a mental illness, and their social media postings. And for all of those three things, Jake Davison seems, in my opinion, to have failed. So, I, I can't explain that. I'm afraid. I think I think somebody didn't do their job properly. I thought it was hard to get guns in this country. Is it easy, that easy to get guns now? I thought, I thought it was difficult as well. Yeah. Wow. I don't know if any of you viewers have any insights into how Jake Davison managed to do it. Really have, uh, yeah, if you, if you know the specifics of how he was able to play the system and get that gun, please put it in the comments section. If you've got any questions for either of us, please put it in the comments section. Uh, in the live chat, I mean, not the comments below, but in the live chat. So, Well Lad wants to know, do you think pornography uh, played a role, plays a role in this? Because, um, for example, I, I you know I do talks in schools, mm. and I'm in the drugs education section, and the PSHE teachers they bring in outside speakers for sex education, and they say if they don't, the only education the kids have got in sex now is internet porn, yeah, and that's warping their minds. I, th I think that's a really good question. Uh, well, that it hadn't really uh, occurred to me, but thinking about it now, I think it probably does. So I think the, the very fact that pornography is so easily accessible now compared to when I was a teenager, for example, um, and it can be, a lot of it is extremely violent. So I'm sure that must feed into young people's impressionable minds of what acceptable sex is. So I think if you're an incel and you're not able to get sex and you're already frustrated, you're already entitled, and then you watch these videos which seem to, to encourage violence towards women and, you know, uh, and think in a hypersexualized manner, then I'm sure it probably does add to the whole belief system. Yeah. So just to recap, if you've jumped on the stream, we've got a lot of people on the stream right now. Dr. Das, who was happened to be in Guildford today, has kindly come to my house in the studio room and we are doing a live stream on the recent spree killer in Plymouth and his relationship, how he was inspired by the other incel spree killers. We've got Elliot Roger and Alec Manessian out of Canada. So Elliot Roger, he did an over 100 page manifesto. He killed mostly sorority type girls, the girls he believed would never sleep with him. I think it was by shooting and stabbing. And Alec Manessian in Canada drove a vehicle into a bunch of people. Elliot Roger is deceased. Alec is in prison in Canada serving a life sentence. So we've been asked in the live chat specifically now by someone who's just come on, what is the definition of an incel? And I will read that to you from the dictionary. It is a member of an online community of young men who consider themselves unable to attract women sexually, typically, typically associated with the views that are hostile towards women and men who are sexually 
active. Quote, self-identified incels have used the internet to find anonymous support. So they have their own language whereby women are called femoids as opposed to females. Femoid. A chad is a alpha male with a Rambo-like jawline. The incels, that the, the men who can't get uh, sexual relations with women are uh, believed, it's believed some of them because they don't have the correct jawline and the skull shape. But there are other variations of incels, such as height cells, who believe they're not tall enough to attract women. Addict cells, are people who are, are drug cells, I can't remember what it was specifically, um, people who've got addiction issues. Men cells. Men cells. Ment cells. Ment cells. So that's people who've got mental health issues such as autism. Yeah. I have to say, from uh, so I, 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 until recently, I didn't know that much about incels. I'd, I'd heard the phrase and I knew very basically what they were, but having done a bit of research, it goes much deeper than I was expecting. So it's not just the belief system and the entitlement towards um, finding a sexual partner, and it's not just the language. They actually have theories, like quite deep, detailed, obviously well thought out theories. So one of them is the black pill theory, which I think is actually relevant to Jake Davison. I believe he expressed on, on one of his videos uh, that he believes in this theory. So that's the theory that people are uh, genetically programmed to be attractive or unattractive. So if you're unlucky enough to have got the black pill, then it's all genetics and it's all chance. And therefore you're kind of, you're doomed by society. To live in. So that's an extension of the matrix, the blue and the red pill. That's where they've got that from. Yeah. So please put in the live, chat if you would like to see Dr. Das come to the studio and do a really lengthy deep dive on incel spree killers and we will find all the clips of the actual incel spree killers talking we'll put those clips on so you can see them and hear them we'll discuss the psychology of them and we'll also get deeper into the terminology and we might even read out some of Elliot's um, manifesto so let us know in the in the chat yeah loads of people in the chat are saying that they would love to see that um the next question that is in the chat does relate to what i just said then and it was we did play earlier on the one and a half minutes of the plymouth shooter talking and manny Tudundi has asked what do you think of his state of mind on that YouTube video. Uh, so I, I did answer this before, shall I? Yeah, just, just, just give a little, little rehash. So, so the thing that really struck me was it seemed that he overtly had some of the symptoms of depression. So he was talking about why do I bother? I'm, I'm in the same situation, the same house, same position. Me against the world, I think was a, a phrase that he used. He talked about being ugly. So to me, this is barn door depression. These are clear symptoms of depression. He did talk about the Terminator to a degree, um, but I don't think that is psychosis. I don't think he believed he was the Terminator. I think he was just adopting that mind frame because he said, I know it's just a movie. Yeah. Do you think that mental health services cuts had a role in this? Several people have asked that. Yeah. Um, I think it's hard to say whether mental health service cuts had a role specifically in this case, because that would depend on whether he saw uh, psychiatric treatment and whether this whether it's available whether he was denied it but to speak about it in broader terms absolutely yeah so over time there has been a decrease in the funding of mental health um, services and issues and the proportion of people that suffer with mental health problems has been rising exponentially there's been a massive cut on inpatient beds in psychiatric hospitals there's been a big push to treat people in the community which in theory is nicer and better for some people because it's less restrict restrictive but in practice, it leaves the people who need a psychiatric hospital out on the streets. Mm. So that's been the, you know, I've been a psychiatrist now for coming on 15 years, and that's been happening the entire time for my career. And I think gradually, uh, sadly, it's getting worse. Yeah, in America, prison system is the biggest house of the mentally ill. And it's like people profiting from the status quo make me sick. Shutting down youth centres, that makes me sick. All these kids on the streets with nothing to do, you know, all the crime, the scoreboard, the knife crime. There needs to be some 
systematic changes to address the root causes of this stuff. So the next question is from Music Spiral Universe. What physically happens when you go psychotic? Wow. <laughs> so people experience psychosis in, in different ways. The main two symptoms are delusions and hallucinations. So delusions are fixed, unshakable beliefs that come from an ununderstandable source. So for example, if you had a very right-wing extreme view or if you had a religious fanatical view, that's not a delusion because that's in keeping with an understandable source. So in people that I see in the mentally disordered offender population, delusions tend to be paranoid. So people are watching me, people are trying to hurt me, people are trying to kill me, people um, are poisoning my food, the neighbours are watching me, the helicopters are following me, the FBI is following me. So there's, these are they, very presentations that I see. The next most common symptoms are hallucinations. So you get visual hallucinations or auditory hallucinations. Contrary to popular belief, actually visual hallucinations are quite rare in psychosis. They tend to happen to people who are extremely unwell. It's far more common for people to have auditory hallucinations, which is basically hearing voices. And the voices can uh, be insulting, they can be derogatory, but the most dangerous type of um, auditory hallucinations, and the one that I see very commonly, are command hallucinations. So that's when a voice is telling you you have to hurt yourself and you have to go out a hammer and you have to go out and hurt, hurt them. So that's in a nutshell what psychosis is. Like you see these cases where you have to go and take your kids out to the desert and kill them. The voice is telling you to do it, or God is telling you to do it. I saw so many headlines like that when I was in America. Yeah. So I, I think I talked about this when I was last time on the podcast, Sean, but the case that just really jumps out to me for so many reasons was Andrea Yates. So in 2001, she become complete, became completely psychotic. She killed her five children. Mm. Uh, it's just, just a horrific, really sad, tragic case. But just in terms of the symptomatology, it's just barn door psychosis and just what happened with the medical, with the whole medical legal trial. It's also fascinating. So I did a video on it on, on my channel. Yeah, and we interviewed Shane Taylor. It's called Knife Maniac's Redemption. And uh, I think that Shane has agreed to come on with Dr. Das. We're going to probe deeper into his mind. And Shane, when he stabbed some people, he went into such a psychosis that he didn't know what he was doing as, as he was walking away with just the knife handle. So I'm wondering then, just adding on to that previous question, when someone starts to hear these voices and have these hallucinations, is there a time, an average time period whereby it goes from the mental to the physical, to actual, the person acting out on that? Um. I don't think it's a time period as such. Well, firstly, I would answer that by saying there's different types of psychosis. So the most common one that I see would be schizophrenia. So that's a long-term chronic psychosis. It's usually lifelong. There are other types of really quick psychosis, like drug-induced psychosis or postpartum psychosis when women have just had children. But we're not talk if we're not talking about those, if we're talking about the more common ones like schizophrenia, it's not necessarily a, a length of time that has to pass. It's different people will have a different threshold of acting upon it. So my analogy um, is, is this, is if you were walking down the street and somebody you didn't know, a complete stranger, just turned around and insulted you, like called you a twat or something, you don't know this Called person. me a bald cell. <laughs> uh, then there'd be a certain proportion of people, uh, I think everyone would be offended, right? But there'd be a certain proportion of people that would do something about it, they might shout back, they might sort of hit back. Most people would probably do nothing. But the proportion that would actually take, uh, take it to the level of physical violence is pretty small. So I think that's the same in psychosis. So the vast majority of people that hear voices don't act in violence, but there's a small proportion who are just willing to take that step. Because in their head, what they experience is real. It's not, it's not their fault, but they believe these voices or they believe these delusions. And you know, if you genuinely thought people were watching you or trying to hurt you, then some, pe some people in that situation would act violently. So it's a bad sequence of events. There was a case where somebody got stabbed on a train in front of his son and I think the guy had a mental diagnosis and there was a there was a dispute and the guy with the mental diagnosis I think was moving away going to went to a different carriage but the guy he'd like had this dispute with had his son with him and felt humiliated and followed the guy and then the guy ended up stabbing him yeah. are you familiar with that case that was yeah. a couple of years back yeah. I think it was just it was one of the local trains uh, around here so it was on the local news quite a bit so you've had a few more questions come in, let me see this. Um, from Louise Sky Bunker, what do you think of religious fundamentalists' mentalities? 
Uh, that's a very interesting question. It's a very broad question. If I had to summarise, um, I think it's really important to differentiate that from mental illness. So somebody who's a fanatic is not suffering from a psychosis most of the time. Uh, it's because that they're, they're indoctrinated with a certain belief system. Now, you could ask what's, what's the point of differentiating that? And basically it comes down to treatment and rehabilitation. You can potentially uh, treat a mental illness through medication, through antipsychotic um, tablets, whereas you can't do that with fundamentalism. But the, the, the root causes for fundamentalism are um, they're very complicated and they're diverse. So it's everything from being marginalised, isolated, to being brainwashed, to feeling a bit worthless, having an inferiority complex, which I suppose some of these mental processes are similar to incels. But then you feel this sense of purpose and you feel the sense of power when you think in your mind that you're fighting for a righteous cause. So it's a completely different thought process to somebody who acts out from mental illness. So Sarah Cowley's pointed out, according to news reports, Davison attended a special needs school. I'm surprised that that had no impact on his ability to hold a gun license. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's a red flag that was missed? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I don't think one can assume that because somebody attended a special needs school that they're automatically dangerous, but um, as you say, it's a red flag if I was on the panel of, a gun, um, of gun licensing, it's something I definitely would need to look into. Um, we're being asked if autism can lead to insanity. Um, so the vast majority of people with autism can lead quite fulfilling lives. Uh, many of them can, can, can live a family life to a degree, they can find employment. I suppose the answer to, to that question is how do you define insanity? If you decide, define insanity like a psychiatrist would, then that would be psychosis. So that would be what I was talking about before, when you're out of touch of reality. So you're hearing things that are... That are don't exist or you're believing uh, ideas that are not based in reality. So a small proportion of people with autism do suffer from that, slightly higher than the general population, so there's an increased risk of psychosis, yeah, but the vast majority of people with autism don't suffer from that. Danny Fauzi has asked, do the occurrence of an attack of psychosis are related with the meds that are prescribed? Do you agree with that? I think what Danny Fauzi is saying is do, medi do antipsychotic medications cause psychosis? And mine said, no, I don't, I don't agree with that. As a psychiatrist, I treat psychosis with, um, with medication. I think medication has got, gets quite a bad press, and I think that's, there's, there's a reason for that. That's because most medications have quite nasty side effects, and it's a big commitment to be on them, especially in the long term. But for the many cases that I've seen, it's, it's far better to have to deal with these physical side effects than living a life where you're tortured by voices or paranoia. But sometimes the unpre unpredictable, there's unpredictable side effects of meds. Because I had a friend who um, got involved in drugs and he was sent to a rehab. It was a Scientology rehab. And they put him on a, a medication that had a side effect of suicidal thoughts and he killed himself. Mm. And they had to pay out a six-figure sum. It's online, that court case. Um, Courtney Bates, his name is, if people want to research that, he was like my right-hand man for a period of time in America. It was really sad. So I think that, um, you know, there's always anomalies and unpredictabilities and, and, and things can happen. It's, it's not a panacea, is it, for all medications? It's not a panacea. There's always going to be some exceptions. Yeah, absolutely, I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Um, all right, so... Kevin Madigan, I'm wondering how if this question would be answered differently in America than the UK. It's a legal question. I know you're not a lawyer, Dr. Das, but I'll put it to you anyway. <laughs> Could you kill a person who's blatantly on a killing spree in the UK? Uh, I think you could. I think you could. I think you'd have a legal defence. Um, I think it would all depend on the evidence, right? So you, you'd have to be able to, to prove with witnesses, for example, that you were, you were doing it to end, end the killing spree. I'm sure, pretty sure you'd get a defence. So if you got manslaughter, um, for example, so the difference between murder and manslaughter in terms of sentencing is that all murder in the UK is a mandatory life sentence. The judge has no discretion. Whereas manslaughter, which would be this case, it's at the judge's discretion. So it could be anything from completely dropping a case and releasing that person to one extreme, so that would be a, um, a situation, battered wife syndrome, where you get somebody who's you know, um, 
killed their partner after years of domestic abuse might be another situation. So everything from that end of the spectrum to a life sentence. Because look at the London terror attacks. There was a guy, I think he was just out of prison, and he grabbed something and put that guy down, didn't he? Yeah. And then the cops came and I think they, I think they executed him, didn't they? Or did, they, did they shoot him or did they arrest him? I can't remember. But he saved lives basically by intervening, using force to intervene. Yeah. Um, so, all right, so Chris Rice, are there any warning signs of schizophrenia? My mate was diagnosed in his early 30s, but I recognised his sometimes irrational anger two decades before he was diagnosed. So the answer to that is yes. There's what, it, what we psychiatrists call a prodrome. So a prodrome, it can be anything from months to even years, is not florid psychosis, but it's a state of, of uh, pseudo-psychosis, for want of a better term. So people have slightly odd thoughts and beliefs and behaviours, um, they might have weird preoccupations, they might say things that sound illogical. So it is like a precursor, a harbinger to actual psychosis. So yeah. So there are articles online talking about how incels overlap with anime. I'm just looking this up right now. And we're going to have to, when Dr. Das comes back, we're going to have to look at all of the different strands of incels when we do our deep dive some people are asking if we would interview an incel so obviously we would not be allowed to broadcast a person putting out certain beliefs that would call for harming people and i just want to put a disclaimer in this video in case it triggers the algorithm that this video is an educational video it's a news video on a true crime channel and I have here an esteemed and professional psychiatrist who worked in Broadmoor giving his professional opinion on this and we are urging any incels who are watching this we're saying look we were all incels at one point in time we were all young lads horny as hell because our hormones were kicking in and we couldn't get laid you're not alone Eventually, you will meet the right person. Having a Rambo jawline is not a massive prerequisite for meeting the woman of your dreams. There are all kinds of people out there with all kinds of interests and all kinds of physical traits. and You will meet someone eventually, and the internet is an ideal tool for meeting other people who are like-minded. It's a tool that we didn't have when we were growing up. But it's also a tool for nutcases getting together, forming these opinions and inciting and manipulating and brainwashing people into killing women and kids. A three-year-old girl just died. It's absolutely horrific. Our mission statement on this channel is to, you know, go after the predators, expose the predators, report on the predators to prevent future victims of crimes, which are predominantly women and kids. It's not a manly thing to do, to pick up a weapon and harm a woman or a child. And if you are an incel and you're contemplating this behavior and you're not gonna kill yourself, you are gonna end up in prison. It's not just the prisoners who are gonna give you a hard time, if not attack you or try and kill you. The guards, the staff, everybody, you will be considered the lowest of the low. There is a hierarchy in prison, and if you are harming women, if you are harming kids, if you are harming young women in the, you know, just starting out in their lives, who have not done anything at all wrong to you, because you feel all women must suffer because of this crazy belief system. If you're engaged in that kind of behavior, you're tempted, don't do it. Don't do it. Get off your computer, channel that energy into physical activity, and into ways that you will meet people get out into healthy communities not communities that are gonna just try and manipulate you into doing all these heinous crimes so they can get off on those evil actions like some puppet masters behind the scene online encouraging young people to get into this and to commit more crimes like this we saw it in america we saw it in canada 
it's here in the UK. We don't want this spreading. If you if you love people, if you love yourself, you've got a bright future ahead of you. If you're going through tough things as a teenager, we've all been there. The hormones kick in, and we 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 we, we rebel against things. We rebel against our parents, the government, whatever it is. We channel energy into these things. It's it's a normal phase of life that you're going through, and you will grow out of it. You will meet someone. Give it time. Anything to add on to that for, for incels who are watching this? I, I, complete, I completely agree with everything you've said, Sean. The only thing I'd add is that the people that you're in the form, forums with and the chats with and the people that might be egging you on and trying to warp your beliefs, they're not going to stand behind you if you get into some serious trouble. You know, they're, they're fake internet friends. Um, they're not going to be standing there in the courtroom trying to support you. And if your life goes down the pan, they're not, they're not real friends. It's not, it's not a real belief system to, that you should be investing your emotional um, effort into. You are being, your life and other people's lives are being sacrificed, basically, by evil puppet masters who are just laughing at you behind the scenes that they have managed to manipulate you into behaving so extreme. So the next question is from Music Spiral Universe. Are you born with mental health disorders? Or conditions, or are they brought on by trauma? So it's the old nature versus nurture sure. debate. Um, I'm happy to answer that. It's, it's a complex question because it depends on so many factors. So something like autism, for example, or a learning disability. So this is what we were talking about before: pervasive developmental disorders. Developmental means exactly that. So it's part of your earlier development. So you are born with those disorders. They might not come out, or they might not become obvious until later on in life. Typically, the age of say four or five but they're, they're, um, they're there, they're permanent. Other types of illnesses such as neuroses, anxieties, depression, they run in families. So if you have a relative, especially a first degree relative and to a lesser extent, second and third degree relative, that has these genes, then that predisposes you to having those kinds of illnesses. And that's very similar with psychosis. So people who have illnesses like schizophrenia in the family are predisposed to suffering it from later life. And then trauma is kind of a beast on, on its own. So trauma can accelerate or trigger some uh, disorders like anxiety and depression, or trauma themselves can cause their own mental disorders. So post-traumatic stress disorder, which I'm sure most of you would have heard of, would be a prime example of that. So that's something that wouldn't have occurred had it not been from an extremely traumatic incident. So that's just a very brief summary, but it's extremely complicated. There's so many different presentations and so many different risk factors but very broadly speaking, it tends to be, generally it tends to be nature and nurture combined. Brilliant. So Dr. Das said he's got a 90 minute uh, time limit this evening. So we've got about 30 minutes left. So keep posting your questions, really appreciate them. But you can find loads more content at his channel. I urge people to subscribe. It, it looks like he's gonna be a regular uh, collaborator with us on our channel now. And you know, the guests come all the way from wherever they live and spend time with us to give us their expertise and it's free to subscribe to their channels. Do you want to just say a little bit about your channel? Sure. So it's been going on for a bit less than a year. It's called A Psych for Sore Minds. Uh, and basically it's my expertise as a consultant forensic psychiatrist. So sometimes I talk about high profile cases, uh, true crime cases, and I give my own spin, like uh, I did a video on Alec Nassian, who we were talking about before, I did a video on Andrea Yates. Sometimes I talk about my own cases of patients that I've seen, which I think is my USP. I think there's nowhere else on the on YouTube you can get that. Obviously, I anonymize my patients out of respect for patient confidentiality and, and the victims involved. Um, but I give my own psychoanalysis. Sometimes I talk about individual diagnoses. Sometimes I interview people who've got experience of mental health issues, like people who've been sectioned in the past, for example. Uh, so there's something for everybody on my channel. I post two videos a week on a Tuesday and Friday. Go check it out. <laughs> and the link to his channel will be in the description box below the video if you're watching this after the live stream. Next question. So we've got a guy who's going through some things as posed the question. UKPI. I have BPD, have done CBT and DBT, but now self-medicating alcohol when needed works for me. But is it the right way to be? I mean, before you start, let me just say alcohol is a drug. And they reckon, you know, you've got like 20, 
what is it, 20 to 40 year, 20 to 30 year run on your liver. Wild man, my best friend since childhood died last year. And he was drinking massive amounts of cider every day. And he couldn't quit his addiction to alcohol, even though he quit all the other hard drugs he was doing in America. So alcohol definitely played a role in his health deteriorating to the point where he had multiple organ failure. He's still here with us in spirit. He's above me, He's looking out, protecting us from the trolls and the black ops. But um, I'll hand that over to Dr. Das. Um, so yeah, happy to answer that question. I'll first disentangle some of those acronyms. So BPD is Borderline Personality Disorder. So I think I spoke about this when I was on your podcast last time. So a personality disorder by definition is when someone's character is flawed. It's different from a mental illness in that a mental illness like psychosis, depression is, is a change in your baseline. Personality disorder is, is very intrinsic. It's part of your personality. So borderline personality disorder typically presents with somebody who's extremely emotional, gets upset quite easily, um, tends to have explosive relationships. Often they use drugs, often they self-harm, often they have this, um, this constant reassure, uh, need for reassurance and a problem with their image. So to answer the questions, when you've been through CBT, it's cognitive behavioural therapy, and DBT, dialectical behavioural therapy, so they're both psychotherapies. The first one, CBT, is used for pretty much any psychological presentation. DBT is, is specialised uh, for borderline personality disorder. So I think the question was, I've tried them, they've not worked, should I self-medicate with alcohol? I think the answer is quite obvious. Um, obviously my answer is going to be no. I think if you're somebody that's um, struggling with your emotions and you can be quite impulsive, potentially aggressive, if you add alcohol into the mix, then that's just going to increase the risk uh, of deteriorating. I would add that not everybody with borderline personality disorder is a threat by any means and, and not all of them have uh, big issues, but obviously this person has, but that's why they've written in. People do grow out of personality disorders over time, especially things like antisocial or borderline. So uh, if, if your current therapy isn't working, you just have to stick with it. Uh, it could be about your engagement with the therapy, the quality of the therapy. Um, so I'm not gonna sit here and lie and say that it's all, it's all perfect and it always works. It doesn't, sometimes it takes cycles. A bit like, for example, when people try and, um, try and quit drugs, sometimes it doesn't work on the first go and it takes a lot of relapses. And remissions and eventually down the line people are successful i think it's for some people it's similar with personality disorders you need to really challenge your thought patterns your beliefs your behaviors if you've got the motivation you've got the insight then i think eventually it will things will click into place but it's not an easy journey well said the next question is from deirdre evangelista is there a correlation between being an incel and narcissism if you look at the three spree shooters for example I mean, Elliot Roger, he had a bit of swagger about him. And it surprises me that he said that he couldn't attract a woman because he was a very good speaker, he was handsome. And he seemed to have, have it going on, really. He didn't, you know, from what we watched earlier about the incel community and how they put themselves down for this and that, he didn't seem to lack attributes, physical attributes, communication skills. He didn't, but do you think he was narcissistic perhaps? I think, I, I think that's, that's a really interesting question. So uh, first of all, I'll speak generally, then I'll, I'll come yeah. on to him. So I think that almost by definition, incels have this inferiority complex. They see themselves as inferior to the chads, for example, and they feel entitled. But at the same time, almost paradoxically, they want attention, um, especially when they do something as drastic as going on a killing spree. So Alec Manassian said directly that he wanted to be famous. I think when we look at Jake Davison, he obviously wanted attention to a degree because you know he made all these YouTube videos, he had so much to say. And then back to, to Elliot Rogers, you know, to, to write a hundred page manifesto and spread it out and, and try and get this movement into belief, by definition you're narcissistic. So I think we've got a slight paradox where they're, they're, they lack a confidence in their own looks and their own sexual ability but they're narcissistic enough to demand this attention. So the answer is both yes and no, simultaneously, that makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes people over scrutinise their looks and it's in the head, isn't it? Uh, you know, analysing themselves in, in the mirror and seeing things that people don't even notice. 
So go easy on yourself, guys, if you're out there and you've got some kind of insecurity. And, and also, I think there's a misconception that, and especially by the inside movement, that women uh, only go for attractive men. I don't think that's true. I think there are some women who like a sense of humour, for example, or who just like acts of kindness. So I think it's a bit short-minded, short-minded to make that assumption that that all women. Definitely. Um, okay, so why was this incident not considered an act of terror? The, the lad was motivated by an extremist ideology. Do you think because it's a new thing, the government, the law is not caught up with it and it will be perhaps classified as a terrorist? I, I think that's a really interesting question. I think arguably I would say that it is an act of terror actually because they've got a political agenda. They've got a hatred towards a very specific subset of people, namely attractive women, and some, not all by all means, but some people who are willing to use violence to for their own, um, to get their values across their own agenda. So I think I think it should be classified as terrorism, and I agree with you, Sean. I think the reason it's not class, it's not seen as classical terrorism is just because it's new and people haven't really got their heads around it and haven't understood it yet. Okay, so... The next question was, um, I just saw it. isn't incel just another word for loner outsider who's bitter at the world? That's from Martin Butler. Let me just say one thing on that then. So perhaps the vast majority of incels fit into that category, but if the ultimate belief system is an incel rebellion where you just take it out on, the females of the world to the murder level then you perhaps are it's like a conspiracy isn't it you're in a conspiracy then to commit murder in the eyes of the law so it's something that you shouldn't subscribe to if you are just a lone outsider who's bitter at the world because killing sprees go against everything human beings stand for so I'd agree with you. I think an incel on its at the very basic level, all incels are people who are loners and outsiders who are bitter at the world, but it's more than that. So it's not just having that belief system, it's also being part of what you think is a movement of other people with the same values. So you get support mainly from the internet and from forums, so it emboldens you. So it's not just that you're bitter, it's just that you're bitter and entitled. I think that's the big difference. People who are incels are they feel entitled, they, they feel they deserve uh, to have sexual partners, and if they can't get them, they feel that they have the right to act out in an aggressive manner towards women with misogynistic views and with violence. Yeah. It is an interesting question. I won't read the name of the person posing it because we've had problems um, repeating those words on this channel lately. <coughs> is the cure for incels to have sex to some degree? Would sex cure an incel? <laughs> Because then they're no longer an incel. <laughs> By definition, if you have sex, you are no longer an incel. I think that an incel who... I suppose it depends on the incel. So if the incel is just a virgin and they just want to lose their virginity, they just want to get out of the way, maybe they're teased at school or their teenage friends have lost their virginity and they're the last one, for example, then it might be enough. It might be that they're just no longer a virgin. They can put that part of that chapter of their life behind them. But I suppose, arguably, if you have somebody else who's already bitter and twisted and has these misogynistic views and, for example, has a random one-night stand and then is ghosted by a woman or um, is, just doesn't connect with her and, for whatever reason, feels rejected after that, then it might actually strengthen their incel uh, beliefs. So I don't think it automatically would cure it, but I think in many cases it would cure it. Yeah. Rebecca Nickel, what do antipsychotics actually do to the brain? What are they treating that causes psychosis? So antipsychotics block dopamine receptors. Um, I've been the first to admit as a psychiatrist that the science behind it is murky and there's so much we don't know, but we are learning through studies uh, regularly. So we know that uh, the dopamine hyperactivity in certain parts of the brain, like the hypothalamus, is connected with schizophrenia. And we know that blocking some dopamine receptors, though not others, uh, has this antipsychotic effect. But they're very blunt tools, and I said this before. Most psycho, uh, most antipsychotics have side effects, and some of them are quite nasty. So I, I, I fully understand why some people wouldn't want to take them, and I think compliance with people with side issues. Like is an issue. yeah. So people are calling us out for saying that he was an incel, but according to the news stories, he was 
commenting online relating to the incel movement. We will look at that more in depth for when we do our deep dive into this. So we're not just pulling this out of the clear blue. So my understanding is that on at least some social media posts, he identified with being an incel. I don't think he mentioned it uh, on every video that he did, but he has at least said that in the past. Yeah. What do you think about what Shaheen Keller has said? Do you think that's a really good way of tackling the issues with incels would be by sitting down and talking, listening to their problems, both real and imagined, to ascertain what may be causing this? I had talk therapy, and I, I fall back on it to this day. So I'm a big supporter of it. So my answer to that would be going back to a previous answer to a previous question, which is can incels be rehabilitated? So I think if somebody has the motivation and the insight to want to change, then absolutely that can help. If they're so fixed in their ideas that they don't want to think any differently, they just want to be part of this movement, then on balance, the chances are talking therapy is not going to make a difference. This is an interesting comment. I just want to read this one out. It's not a question from Ryan Turner. Um, most women just want someone kind and funny. Looks are very unimportant once they get to know a man. Stop being weird and find an interesting hobby and some mates and chill out. It's common sense, isn't it? And, do you want to add, add anything to that? Um, I just think, you know, you can't, you, we can't pretend that, um, that we understand the motivations of all women. I think... Really yeah, yeah I, think, I think it's fair to say some women are only attracted to attractive men that's definitely a truism but other women are not and other women are perhaps less shallow and look for uh, deeper character traits so from Shaheen again uh, oh no we had that one sorry I think it was, they repeated the question oh god the sims do you think applying electrical shocks to the brain for long term depression is right or wrong oh, so, wow I think what she's talking about is ECT, electroconvulsive yeah. therapy. Now, ECT has definitely got a bad press historically, and, and rightly so. So it used to be a very barbaric practice, uh, and it used to be done with very little consent <clears throat> for some patients, with very little rationale, as some psychiatrists literally just experimenting, and it used to be done without anaesthetic or without muscle relaxants. So for those reasons, it does have this very barbaric image. However... ECT is actually very effective in some extreme orders. So not for average, normal, mild, moderate depression, but in very severe depression, or in depression where there's an, an acute risk of suicide or people are not eating, or for treatment resistant schizophrenia, studies have consistently shown that ECT is actually effective. And I've seen it with my own eyes work on some patients. So I don't think, I don't think it works, I don't think it's appropriate for every psychiatric disorder by any means, but in some specific cases, absolutely, it's, uh, it's definitely effective. Matt Dow has asked, what is the difference between an incel and an asexual? Um, so I think somebody who's asexual is somebody who has no interest in sex whatsoever, so they just don't see themselves as much of a sexual being. Whereas an incel is somebody who can't get sex, but desperately wants to and feels entitled because of the position they're in. And they channel that anger and frustration out towards attractive women. So that's the difference. Just going over the, the de dictionary definition. The first one is not involved, not involving sexual activity, feelings or associations, non-sexual. And then the next one is of a person having no sexual feelings or desires or not sexually attracted to anyone. So to put it in a very simple analogy, a priest is asexual, or should be asexual. Well, they should be, but <laughs> when you suppress it, it causes um, bizarre behaviour and criminality and all kinds of deviant uh, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, as we know from certain cases that we don't report on anymore. All right, so... <laughs> monk, let's say monk. Monk is asexual. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Ray J, do we, do we know anything about his childhood, family life, father figure, how his mother treated him? Because there's rumours that he's, he was getting scolded by his mother, isn't there? Uh, yeah, I, I've got to be honest with you, Ray J, I've not had the time to research uh, Jake Davison in much detail. I've just been so busy with other work. But I do know that he had fallen out massively with his mother. And my understanding is that it's because he believed that she owed him money, uh, like a disability benefit for his autism. So that was one of the reasons... Uh, that he acted out in such an angry manner. Have you ever looked at Edmund Kemper, the serial killer? Uh, only from the 
bit, what's that TV series called? Was it Mindhunter? Mindhunter, Mind, Mind, yeah, yeah. He had an interesting relationship with his mother. All right, so Damon Brutz. Is it better to be hot and bothered or cold and not bothered? Can someone be cold and bothered? <laughs> I'm getting trolled. All right, Donnell. <laughs> Dr. Das, do you think the International Manual of Diseases stance on personality disorder is superior to the US's DSM? I should have that last time. There. I hear you all simply have the diagnoses of personality disorder with features. So it's kind of... It's quite complicated, and I suppose it depends how you use either uh, diagnostic manual. So the DSM, especially the DSM-5, talks more about traits rather than individual diagnoses. So I think it's arguable that's more of an effective way to do it, because otherwise you're kind of labelling things that are, uh, that are normal human emotions. Whereas if you're talking about dimensions, then you're, you're recognising that you're only diagnosing something if it is impacting that person. So I think the newer American system is better. I just just as a, as a quick sort of side note, uh, I've done a couple of um, videos on personality disorders in the past, including on my channel, and I have received quite a lot of backlash and a bit of vitriol. And I think that's <laughs> because the diagnosis of personality disorder is contentious. And I agree with that. I've never, I've never said that, that that's not the case. I'm purely telling you scientifically what the definition is. I think there's a very just argument that over-diagnosing them or labelling somebody with a personality disorder is damaging. Brilliant. We've got about 10 minutes left before Dr. Das has to dash. So if you've got your final questions, please put them in the live chat right now. And please support Dr. Das at his channel, which is called... A Psych for Soul Minds. The link for that will be at the top of the description box below this video when I finish this live stream. So, next question is, what is the long-term side effect from sertraline? Never heard of it. And how does it work? So sertraline is an SSRI, so it's a serotonin-specific receptor inhibitor. So um, like all SSRIs, it blocks, it blocks the way that... that um, some neurotransmitters are received into receptors and because it blocks them those neurotransmitters build up in synapses and that includes um, serotonin which as we know is like a happy drug so what was the question what are the side effects yeah. so the side effects side effects for, for different people on, on even on the same drug are unpredictable but generally speaking you can get agitation you can get drowsiness in some people, a small proportion, but it sounds like maybe your, your friend uh, fell victim to this, you can get an increase in suicidality mm. for the first couple of weeks. Um, and you can get problems with your sleep as well. But it, it basically, it's, and again, I, I'm the first to admit this as a psychiatrist, there is a degree of trial and error with different medications. Some people feel the benefits of antidepressants immediately with very little side effect profile. And some people are very unfortunate and antidepressants do very little for them but they feel the side effects so you have to experiment to a degree the best way to do that is to start on a low dose and increase very very gradually of course the disadvantage of doing that is that it takes longer for you to actually get to a dose where you're potentially treating depression so the blonde pixie wants to know are incels the next generation of men who used to follow neil strauss's the game where they want tens and are rejected by those women so the blonde pixie is, is asking then are incels the next generation of pickup artists yeah. who desire women they classify as tens only to be rejected by them? Uh, I think there's a big difference in pickup artists and incels. I think that they share some of the core beliefs, which are quite misogynistic and disrespectful to women, and uh, an entitlement to gain attractive women. So that's what they've got in common, but I think they've got a lot more um, that's, that's different in their values. So pickup artists almost see attractive women as a challenge and they kind of dedicate themselves into getting more proficient at, um, at obtaining attractive women. Whereas incels believe right from the get go that they can't, that they're not attractive enough themselves and they feel angry about that and they take that anger out. Sometimes in the terms of violence, sometimes in terms of misogynistic language and views, they take that anger out of women. So the base thought processes are similar, but the, the, um, the secondary beliefs and the activities around it and the, the extreme levels they're willing to go to are completely different. So here's a question from Ian Christopherson. 
Is there a correlation between bodybuilding steroids and murder? <laughs> Uh, I think there is a weak correlation. So the steroids that you use for bodybuilding is known to cause uh, impulsivity. It's known to cause aggression. It's, it's known to cause rage, roid rage. So I think there is a weak correlation. And you remember, the vast majority of people, vast vast majority of people who get angry, don't end up killing somebody. So the, the chances or the proportion of that is already small. So being on steroids will, will increase that a little bit. So the answer is yes, there's a correlation, but it's a weak correlation. The Sims wants to know, why did they get rid of Asperger's Syndrome in the Psychiatrist Manual? So the new version of DSM has got rid of Asperger's Syndrome just because <clears throat> Asperger's Syndrome is, is kind of like a milder version of autism and some of the features are absent. So for example, you don't have language delay in Asperger's whereas you do in autism. So I think the thinking behind it was that it's too complicated to have all these different versions of an, of an illness with different names and it's simpler to have one all-encompassing term and you talk about the severity within that term. So I think it's to simplify the classification, although arguably it might be quite disorientating to somebody that has Asperger's for their whole life, you get used to the terminology, you get used to the diagnosis, then suddenly out of the blue, it's kind of the rug is pulled away underneath it. So I understand the theory behind it, but I also think it can be damaging in some ways. Alexis Le LeMay, is there an increase in narcissism in our current society? I think Instagram and all these platforms are encouraging it, aren't they? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think narcissism's always been there, um, but the platform to show it off is so much more wider than it used to be a generation ago, even you know, 10, 20 years ago. So it's not the narcissism that's increased necessarily, but it's the, it's, it's the activities and the opportunities to show off your narcissism. Music Spiral Universe, what are the signs someone is mentally cracking? Um, I suppose that, that depends on how you define mentally cracking. My interpretation of that would be somebody that's having like some sort of mental breakdown. It's different from different people. Um, it could be anything from losing your temper to becoming paranoid, uh, to becoming quite low in mood, losing your energy. I think for me, it's not necessarily about the signs, but it's about the level of functioning. So. People can have all of those symptoms and behaviours that I just described, but can function quite well. They probably need some attention, probably need some help, but it's probably not as desperate, for example, needing to go to psychiatric hospital or needing to be sectioned as somebody who can't function. So somebody who's not able to have a family life, hold down relationships, hold down a job, that to me is, is a far more significant indication of somebody having a mental breakdown than any one symptom. Got a guy here who's been very honest with what he's saying here. He's saying he could he could be on the verge at some point of doing something. Hello, Sean and Dr. Das. I have paranoid schizophrenia and I have very bad command hallucinations and worry that one day I will act on the command because it's very dangerous. Could you tell me how not to act? Uh, yeah, that is, I have to say, extremely worrying. Um, that's not a healthy situation um, at all. Michael Darby, I think that you need to you need to address that. So I think the first thing you need to do is speak to your family, speak to your general practitioner. If you're struggling to get an appointment or you're you're struggling to to actually get any engagement, which I'm very sad and ashamed to say is is often the case nowadays, then you need to go to any accident and emergency. I think it's quite dangerous to assume that you can that you can just minimise them or ignore them. Um, I can see someone else has just asked what is a command hallucination. So just to to help put that question into context. A command hallucination is, is usually in the form of hearing a voice telling you to do something. So classically, it can be to hurt yourself or to hurt other people. Only a very small proportion of people with schizophrenia have the symptom, but it's, it's a presentation that I personally see very commonly because it leads to violence and offending. So it leads to people ending up in my services. PTA, how responsible is CAMHS for identifying potential incels? So that's CAMS, that's the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service. Um, I think that CAMS, generally speaking, isn't responsible. And the reason for that is because it's about addressing, uh, well, first of all, they're under-resourced under and understaffed. So they tend to see children who um, are presenting with very overt mental illness, such as depression, suicidality, psychosis. Being in itself is obviously not healthy, but it's not technically a mental illness. It's, it's um, a warped system, value system, a warped way of thinking. So I don't think the onus is on CAMS to try and sort this out. I think the 
the onus is on um, parents and schools to try and try and root out this hateful behaviour and address it. Why are command hallucinations never about helping people? Why are they always telling you to do bad, violent things? That's interesting. Yeah, that is an interesting question. And in my career, I have on very rare occasions seen voices, not necessarily command hallucinations, but voices in general or even delusions that can be quite pleasant. But it is a small minority. The vast majority of people have unpleasant experiences. And I can only assume that the reason for that is because people who are mentally ill have... Um, psychological turmoil somewhere it's either because they've had abuse or trauma in their upbringing or because they they know that they're having experiences that other people aren't having and they have a degree of insight so i think it's it's more people in that situation are going to be psychologically distressed than are going to be in a happy stable balanced place but it is theoretically uh, possible it's rare but it's possible for somebody to have happy hallucinations what was the gentleman who said he was on the verge earlier? Was that was it Richard Murray? Uh, no, it wasn't. No. no. Can't see his name, I'm afraid. Richard said, I was recently in a psychiatric unit after an episode. They refused to section me as I have long time BPD. They said it would make me worse. Was this, in your view, correct of them to discharge me? That is a good question. It's complicated. So I think the problem is that some people with BPD, which is borderline personality disorder, can be seen as being quite challenging in their behaviour and problematic. Don't jump back down my throat, that's not me saying that people with that diagnosis are, I'm saying that it can be perceived that way by a lot of people that work in mental health, such as nurses and doctors. So there's an argument that people who are suffering from short-term crises shouldn't be admitted to a psychiatric ward because there's no short-term fix for that. You can't cure somebody of that. The treatment is far more long term and it can be given in the community rather than on the psychiatric ward. And some people with personality disorders can unsettle wards. So if they're challenging um, nurses, if they're breaking boundaries, if they're breaking rules, if they're bringing drugs into the ward, if they're being aggressive, then uh, it can really cause damage to the other patients. So I think in some situations, doctors and nurses don't want to admit people with borderline personality disorder because there seems to be little advantage and lots of disadvantage having said that there are other cases where they might have temporary psychosis which i think this gentleman who asked the question might have been suffering from and in those cases i think that there is a rationale to treat them in the short term yeah. i'm presently putting all of dr das's links in the live chat we've run out of time now folks really appreciate your interest and staying with us um, this evening for an hour and a half. If you do have any further questions, Dr. Das is also on Twitter. So I'm sure you could tweet him over there. And I urge people to subscribe to his channel, A Psych for Sore Minds. I'm gonna put it in the chat again right now. So it's just one click away if you guys wanna to subscribe to his channel. Before we go, I'll just ask Dr. Das what he's presently doing, what what plans he's got for his channel, what projects he's working on? Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm doing bits and pieces of, of um, recording documentaries, doing something with Donald uh, McIntyre. Um, I have just finished drafting a book, which will be released next spring. Uh, by Link doesn't work. Link doesn't work. Oh, shit. Let's see what's going on. What? Yeah. I will correct the link right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, yeah, keep talking, uh, yeah sorry. and in terms of my YouTube channel, I'm basically trying to find interesting cases all the time. My uh, problem is is just time. I'm I, I find it quite busy to fit it all in, but I pick high profile cases. So, for example, if you've heard of um, Tyra Hadley, who killed his own parents at the age of 18, did a video about him recently. I've got a video about the Unabomber, which I think will be coming out on my channel tomorrow. Wow. Specifically, does he have schizophrenia? Because there's a there's a, a there's at least some forensic psychiatrists that believe he did versus some that didn't. Uh, another case that I did was Valerie Bacco, who is a woman who was 40 years old, who recently killed her husband in the context of being horrifically abused over the, the space of many, many years. Um, and so it was all about, my video is all about her defensive battered wife, a battered woman syndrome. Um, so yeah, so I've just got lots of different topics on my YouTube channel, go check them out. And if you've come to the stream later on, in the beginning, we did ask the viewers if you would like to see 
Dr. Das come to the studio and do at least two hours on the incel spree killers. So let us know right now if you'd like to see that. And we will also, if you've got any further questions, actually, we could carry those questions over to that podcast. But don't put them in the live chat. Put those questions in the comment section now. We will pull them out of the comment section and build on what we have discussed today. We will look deeper into the language of the Intel community. We will read out some of Elliot Roger, his manifesto. Obviously, we can't, you know, use words that incite anything or will trigger the YouTube algorithm. So we have to proceed cautiously with this, but we'll go as deep into it as possible. And we also aim to take some clips of Elliot Roger and our Plymouth shooter and analyze, you know, the psychology of what they're saying and perhaps look at the body language, the mindset. This is a stark difference between Elliot Roger and the Plymouth shooter in uh, the communication skills. So it's really fascinating, this whole thing that's kind of new. You know, many people I've spoke to had no idea that the Plymouth shooter was linked to the Intel community. So we're going to see what we can, what more we can find out because again, this is an educational video. We're reporting news. We want people out there who perhaps are contemplating supporting these communities to pull away from that and channel that energy into more positive things. Because if you do survive, going on a shooting spree the rest of your life is going to be hell because they don't treat people who harm women and kids lightly in prison environments and even if you're locked away in a cell all on your own they'll get you through your food they crush gap glass and put it in your food they put hypodermic needles in there with hepatitis and put it in your food you got to go to court someday, they'll get you in the prison van on the way to court. Oh, the guards will get you. The guards will look at you as such a piece of shit that the guards will handle that business themselves. So there is no future for people contemplating this kind of action. And we urge young people who perhaps, you know, are excited by this or think it's fun or interesting to think twice because it's completely evil to harm people just starting out in their life especially and a three-year-old girl that is absolutely disgusting to kill a three-year-old to kill anyone is terrible but to kill a three-year-old girl who's not harmed anyone in the bloody world at all oh my god imagine the horror of what she went through it's, it's, it's that's that's insane so we're going to go deeper on this. Thanks for your love and support this evening. Thank you for all the questions. I feel um, a real sense of community this evening with everybody, just the questions coming in constantly. Um, most of all, thank you to Dr. Das for coming over here. He's obviously had a long day at work doing whatever he's been doing today. It's 10 o'clock at night and he's still going. He probably just wants to get to bed. So please support him by subscribing to his channel. I'm going to put the link in one more time before we sign off. There's his channel. Let's help Dr. Das get to 10,000 subscribers. Come on now. And that link is working. And um, everybody have a great night out there. I've really enjoyed this. And we are now going to sign off. Is there anything you'd like to say in conclusion? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, as always, Sean, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to work with you, be on your channel. Thank you very much for your time, viewers. Uh, I hope I answered some of your questions. Hope you enjoy my content on my channel, and I hope to see you soon. All right, so to the loop to everybody, on Saturday morning, we have got the Wild Woman podcast coming out at 10 a.m. It couldn't be released today because we have got a glitch on YouTube right now. There's a glitch on YouTube whereby you cannot do a, a video premiere. How insane is that? So we are going to be doing that one 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. Um, that's where we're going to be broadcasting it on the channel with the premiere because we want it to be an event. We want, we want to see the, the live chat, the comments, the feedback. 
And the other thing is as well, I've got a glitch with my Zoom right now where I can't live stream with more than one person simultaneously. I'm doing this on my phone because Dr. Das is here. That's an ongoing problem. So it looks like the Atwood Unleashed is going to be on uh, Patreon on Wednesday, um, 6 p.m. And then we've got um, an almost four hour, over four hours of Wildman and Purple Aki stories coming out from Wildman's cousin soon as well. So lo loads more Wildman content coming out soon. All right, so I'm going to shut this off now. I'm going to go into the dashboard somehow and turn this off. Let's see how we do this. I could just do it on my phone, I guess. If I pick my phone up. Bye, everybody. Bye. Perhaps if I press this cross here. Thanks for being with us tonight. See you at the next one. You want to stop streaming? Yes, there we go. That should do it.